Hello and welcome to Rue and Stu in the Shed. It's a chat show, a podcast, or maybe a shedcast would be better, in which Ruth and I chat to members of the church family about faith and life. That's just about it. And so, Ruth, who have we got with us this week? This week we've got Marlene Hewitt with us. So Cromwell's just saying hello to he's with us. So Marlene, welcome. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you some questions. So the first question I'm going to ask is how how you came to faith. How did you find your faith? And um, tell us. Well, that. I suppose you've got to go back a long way, because although I wasn't brought up in a Christian home, my mum and dad sent me to Sunday school every Sunday afternoon at three o'clock. Off I trotted, and I can remember my Sunday school teachers and the stories that I was hearing. And there was a little chorus that I used to sing. I'm not too young to come to Jesus for he loves a little child. I need him. He needs me. And oh, how happy he would be if I come now. And I used to sing that and I really meant it. That was my way of coming to Jesus. And I really, looking back on it, think that that was when Jesus came into my life. And there have been lots and lots of occasions since then when I recommitted myself to God, when I learned more about God. I was enormously helped by a Christian friend when I was in um, year eight, as it would be called now, at uh, secondary school, when a Christian girl took me along to the Scripture Union and it taught me more about God. And by that stage, I realised I needed to be more involved with, with church and through church activities, youth activities, my faith was enriched and deepened, and um, that's really basically it. Um, what difference would you say that faith makes in your life? You know, it is something that stayed with you and every day it's, relevant and so on. Yes, because. Um, I once said that the difference that faith makes is all the difference in the world. You know, if I think about the, the Bible verses that I live with, um, one of my favourite verses is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that has stuck with me. And I know that God is in my life and that in all the ups and downs of life, he's never let me down. The steadfast love, and that's a really rich word because it just means that it's unconditional love poured out on us and it never, ever fails us. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. And I know that nothing can ever separate me from God's love. And that he walks with me and talks with me to use another old chorus that we used to sing along life's narrow way. And when you have that sort of friend always at your right hand, there's nothing life can throw at you that you can't cope with if he's there. And that's the difference faith makes. You know, and I've proved that when we've met with difficult situations in life when I experienced the death of my father and later my mother and young people who were dear to me, then I knew that nothing, nothing can separate me from God's love and that he can take me through life safely. So Marlene, I'm interested, how did you, how did you start preaching? How, how did that come about? Oh gosh, that's a long story. Um, Really, on the days when I was, um, as a professional teacher, working in the classroom and everything, I mean, I was teaching English and communication was important to me. And I knew that there were things I wanted to talk about. And I loved teaching. And so it was difficult in a church situation because I was welcomed as a teacher of young people or as a teacher of children. But there were a lot of people who weren't so happy about me teaching adults. So it first happened when Paul and I started or were instrumental in, in initiating a group called Adult Christian Education, which took place on Sunday nights at Kidlington Baptist Church. And 
we had sort of slots of six weeks, three times a year. And sometimes we would be short of a speaker or there was a topic that we really felt was important to talk about and we couldn't get a speaker. And so Paul said, why don't we do that? And I said, well, do you think they would let me do it? And he said, well, maybe if we did it together. And that's the way it started. You know, I can remember one of the first ones that we did was about the role of women in the church and whether or not women could teach. And we decided we would do it almost like a debate. And he would say, women should not be preaching. Women should not be teaching. No, I said that. I said women shouldn't be teaching and women shouldn't be preaching. And he did it the other way around saying, yeah, women should be teaching. Women can preach. It's all scriptural. And we argued the case and um, that was when it really started. And I suppose it flourished or came to fruition when Graham Sinden was our minister because he encouraged me and uh, gave me opportunities to preach at Kidlington. And, uh, you know, after that, there was no looking back. I was just able to communicate one of my passions, which is God's word and God. I mean, I've had the privilege of leaving a house group with you for some time. And I mean, I always think that um, you use your teaching skills really well um, in terms of uh, making people feel comfortable, drawing people out. I mean, I just imagine you in, in the classroom with people who are a bit bored with the lesson uh, and you're bringing them out. I mean, I, I'm glad that you, you relate the skills. I mean, does it, do you feel you're doing that? Well, I, I just like people and I like to talk about life and um, about what makes us all tick. And I was very blessed in that, um, although it was one of my history teachers who said, have you ever thought about being a teacher? Because the way you write suggests that you can order things in a way that um, makes it very clear. And you know, you communicate well, you should think of teaching. And for a long time, I thought I might be a history teacher because it was a history teacher who said that to me. And then I, the day came when I had to choose between English and history as my, as my main subject for my degree. And I realized then that the love of my life was English. And English is one of those subjects that when you teach it, you're teaching about life because literature reflects life. And it's all about love and death and time and how we respond to other people. And it, you know, when you talk to children, young people about books and about literature, you're talking to them about life. And although in a sense, it's the experiences that you have through reading are not first-hand experiences. They're vicarious experiences that because of the power of the writer takes you into new worlds, different situations, different experiences, and it enhances your understanding of life and your understanding of people. And, you know, so when I was teaching, it was just so much joy to be able to, to talk about it because teaching is a two-way process. And when you get young people on that cusp of entering into adult life who are being shaped and formulated, there's nothing more exciting than talking with them about big issues. I loved it. Now, you have a few books behind you. Is there one book that you would pick out as a book that you particularly enjoyed? Do you know, I sort of thought you might ask me that. And the answer is, and it's going to make me sound awfully, awfully pious and goody goody. But that's the book. It's the Bible. The Bible is a writ. I mean, it's a library in one, isn't it, really? And it's the book that I go back to over and over again every day because there's always something new to learn. And so many times, as Stuart will understand, because he's contributed, as, you know, he's a contributor to this. It's always an encounter with God. And certainly in lockdown, um, it's been a rich time of encounter with God. In terms of other sorts of books, at different times in my life, if you'd asked me that question when I was 10, I would have said Little Women. And there were chapters I could nearly repeat by heart because I just loved the book. You know, at different times, it's been different books. And of course, it isn't always a novel. 
sometimes, I mean, I'm, I just love the poetry of Jared Manley Hopkins, John Donne, George Herbert. I love reading about history, so I will read history books, but also historical novels. Um, and I love reading books about the Bible. I love reading books about philosophy. It's just so rich. Now, Paul will call it my trashy novelettes. <laughs> They're not trashy novelettes. And even he has to admit that some of them are just so rich. And one of the things that always makes me giggle is because if you want English used superlatively well, read a book by an Irishman. Because although for many people, you know, our ancestry might have been in the, the Gaelic language, but they use English superbly well. So I love Sebastian Barry and Jonathan Swift and uh, Sean O'Casey and all that stuff because they make the language sing. Now you mentioned lockdown and I think Ruth, that was something that, that we wanted to pursue. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, what, what what sustained you during lockdown? What what have you found that sustained you? <laughs> I think I've probably pro partly answered that. I spend a lot of time in this wee room, and I have books all around me, and I'm reading, 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 reading. And at the moment, I'm reading a book about Donald Trump, written by his niece Mary Trump. I'm also reading a fascinating book about the Book of Beginnings, which is a book of Genesis. A about Genesis, written by Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who died not all that long ago. And boy, is he steeped in the Old Testament. And it's so rich and it's enhanced my understanding of that. And, you know, so books have sustained me. I'm talking about books. You know, I have a friend I go walking with and we would just talk about books. And of course, as soon as you say walking, well, we're a wee bit more restricted at the minute, but walks have sustained me sometimes paul has to drag me out kicking and screaming but um you know when i'm out i think oh i'm glad i came because the exercise helps I'm, I'm me well for that look <laughs> <laughs> and i mean as soon as you as say paul drags me out paul has sustained me because he's funny and uh He's also, you know, I bounce ideas off him, he bounces ideas off him, and sometimes we just sit together, curled up, and read. Um, so that has sustained me. Although I don't like it, because I, I'm a people person, and I just want to give you hugs, and, you know, I miss my grandkids, I miss my friends, but... I'm so thankful to God that I can at least see my grandchildren. I can see my children. I can have conversations with them through this. I can talk to you two great people today and it's, it's fun. So Zoom has helped enormously. And of course, there's always the, the rock who is Jesus and he's just there. So in lockdown, it's God, Paul, books, WhatsApp, Zoom, fresh air walks. And I should be doing more exercise. You know, I did a workout the other day and surprised myself that it didn't collapse in a heap afterwards. <laughs> it, it's clear. One of the questions is, what are your passions? But obviously you, you've told us <laughs> books are your... If you've got books any are my passion. Teaching is my passion. And I suppose deep down there somewhere, God is my passion. Yeah. Yeah. And we wanted to ask you if there were two people other than Paul or your family that you could choose to be in lockdown with, um, anybody, who would you choose? Which two people would you choose to be in lockdown? Do you know, that's a really good question. And, and Stuart hinted that that might be one of the questions he would ask. And so I thought a bit about that one. And I'm glad I wasn't just asked to do it off the top of my head. But the first person that I would like to have a conversation with and who's dead is my maternal grandmother. She died when she was 47 of stomach cancer and I was only about eight or nine at the time so I never really knew her, not as an adult in the way that I knew my paternal grandmother and, and uh, I would love to spend time with her because I discovered as I grew up and was talking to one of my aunts one day, 
that my grandmother had a very real faith that sustained her through a very painful death from stomach cancer. And I would just love to talk to her. I have a photograph of her up there and she's, she just looks like such a gentle, kind woman. And the other person, I, you see, there are all sorts of famous people and there are characters from the Bible and you think, oh, it would be great to have a conversation with them. But I think one of the things that would make me hesitant about using some of those big names is that I would freeze. I wouldn't know what to talk about. I'd be intimidated. I don't have a great sense of self-worth or anything, you know, so I would struggle with that. So I thought, who would be a sort of person that I wouldn't be intimidated by and that I could just relax with and learn from? And the person I came up with was Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, she was very young when she had Jesus. Yeah. And Luke says that she watched and she listened yeah. and she pondered things in her heart. Yeah. And I would love to, to talk about what it was like being the mother of God. Yeah. And I mean, it just, it's mind blowing that. Can you imagine what a conversation with her would be like? I would just... I would love it. Yeah. Who knows? Oh, maybe someday. Hmm. You, you ask a million passion. questions, you two, you there's, know. There's I like being another, in your shed in your library, Stuart. <laughs> thank you, Molly. There's, there's another passion that I would um, like to ask you about. Because one of the more amusing times I have spent a time with you was watching a rugby match. <laughs> Is it, true to say, is it true to say that when Ireland are playing rugby, you occasionally get a little bit enthusiastic? You're dead right, aren't you? <laughs> Oh, gosh. The first time Paul took me to a live international, it was really very embarrassing because I was totally caught up in the experience. And I was just rooting for them, you know. And I discovered that at one point I was going, go, 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 go. And shouting things, you know, to encourage my team. And I realised that I was battering on the man in front of me. Who, <laughs> bless him, turned round and sort of gave a weak grin. <laughs> but it's, oh, oh I, yes, I, I love it. But it's not good for my blood pressure, you know. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't really say... It's not good you're for over, my blood pressure. I wouldn't say you're over the top, Marlon. It's just that when you came around to us, our television actually spent the afternoon in a darkened room. <laughs> because of the uh, way it'd be shouted at. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. And and um, Marlene, if you had to choose um one of your favourite Bible verses, what what Bible verse would you? I think it's the ones that I. You see, I can't choose just one, but I thought of the. Um, it's impossible, really. Isn't it's it? you know, it is impossible. So I I suppose. The little sequence that I hang on to is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Um, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And because of all those, I can do all things through Christ, who is my strength. Yeah. Or who strengthens me, depending on what version you use. Yeah. So those are ones that I hold very dear. Yes. Yeah. Do you know one of the things that I think is sad now? When we were kids, we had to learn great chunks of the yeah. Bible. Yeah. And I wish we did that more with young people. That's why the other week when, when Phil was teaching us our memory verse of the year, yeah. you know, all the actions, I thought, yeah, yeah go for it. Yes. Mm -hmm. But of course, as you say, that has become difficult because there are so many uh, different versions. And versions. Which, which version? Yeah. Um, yeah, I about? often think that that's the thing that dates me more than even my hands and my wrinkles. It's the fact that I, all my quotations are from the King James because that was when I was sort of learning so much. And they used that the King James version. We're running out of time, but I think that Already? I think that Cromwell, who has been oh, very quiet, may have a question for you. Marlene, his oh. question is: 
Cats or dogs? Cats dogs. Yeah. Gorgeous. He is gorgeous. I yeah. love. You see, he's we had one. Friend. We had a beautiful border collie, as you know, called Bryn, and. I think Paul was so shattered when Din, when Bryn died that he just said, "I can't go through that. I can't go through that again." But no. I miss my Bryn. Oh, that's it. Look, well done. He's beautiful. <laughs> well, that was a lovely chat. I hope I didn't talk too much, guys. Well, Marlene, thanks for your time, and thank you for watching. And we will be back next week with a brand new shitcast. Thank you.